What most people know as ammonia is a product readily available at the market. It is household ammonia, actually ammonium hydroxide, from 2 to 10 percent ammonia dissolved in water. Household ammonia is valued as a detergent and disinfectant, but using it can be unpleasant because of its pungent, irritating odor. It is this distinctive odor that it has in common with anhydrous ammonia, a widely used substance which is a hazardous material. This program is designed to provide assistance and training for personnel who must take action in the event of an emergency involving anhydrous ammonia and is part of a series called HASCHEM. The program will describe where anhydrous ammonia may be found, tell what its principal hazard properties are, and suggest procedures for emergency action in the event of an uncontrolled discharge or fire. Anhydrous means without water. The chemical formula for anhydrous ammonia is NH3. The product has been classified by the U.S. Department of Transportation as a non-flammable gas and may be classified as a poison gas in international shipments. The penetrating, suffocating odor of anhydrous ammonia is its principal characteristic. The product's greatest danger to people is its caustic effect. Ammonia vapors are highly irritating and harmful to the eyes, the respiratory tract, and the skin. At room temperature and pressure, anhydrous ammonia is a pungent, colorless, alkaline gas. Under pressure, it is a colorless liquid. It can be stored and transported near atmospheric pressure when refrigerated to below its boiling point of minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. It is normally transported under pressure. This test shows what happens when anhydrous ammonia is released. When the liquid contacts the air, it rapidly expands 850 times. This expansion is accompanied by extreme cold temperature, which condenses moisture in the air, producing a visible vapor cloud. The product is lighter than air, but wind, temperature, humidity, unevaporated ammonia droplets, and the supercooling of the surrounding air can cause the vapor cloud to hover near the ground. Ammonia, a naturally occurring compound, is one of the most important chemicals in daily use, with about 20 million tons manufactured in North America annually. Some 500,000 workers are potentially exposed to its hazards. It may be called liquid ammonia, ammonia gas, spirit of hartshorn, or just anhydrous. Anhydrous ammonia is most widely used in agriculture. When crops grow, nitrogen is removed from the earth. Ammonia, an excellent source of nitrogen, is applied to replenish the soil. As much as 200 pounds per acre may be injected directly into the soil by specially designed applicator equipment, or it may be added to irrigation water. Anhydrous ammonia is also used to manufacture other fertilizers, such as ammonia salts, nitrates, and urea. Other users include manufacturers of military and industrial explosives, chemical and pharmaceutical manufacturers, the rubber industry, petroleum refiners, and diazo printing. Anhydrous ammonia is used in processes that require protective atmospheres. Other users include water treatment plants, pulp paper manufacturers, and makers of plastics and synthetic fibers. Another widespread use of ammonia is as a refrigerant it is the oldest and one of the most economic refrigerants known. In NFPA 49, hazardous chemical data, the reactivity hazard for anhydrous ammonia is listed as zero, indicating a material which is normally stable and not reactive with water. Anhydrous ammonia is stable, yet will react with many substances. One reaction can be demonstrated by combining two common household products, ammonia and chlorine bleach. The result is nitrogen trichloride gas, which is extremely sensitive and explosive. But ammonia is reactive with other substances as well, in this instance, iodine. 
some other reactive substances are non-oxidizing mineral acids, organic acids, organic hydrides, vinyl acetate, gold, silver, and mercury. Ammonia is not reactive with water and in fact is highly soluble in water. However, there are some attendant hazards. Anhydrous ammonia liquid has a high heat of solution in water. If water is poured onto a pool of liquid anhydrous ammonia, the product will boil vigorously, increasing vapor release. The health hazard for liquid anhydrous ammonia is three, indicating a material which on short exposure can cause injury even when prompt medical attention is given. This experiment with a flower demonstrates the refrigerating and caustic properties of ammonia. Contact with liquid ammonia can damage human tissue. Frostbite is followed by severe chemical burns. Concentrations of anhydrous ammonia vapors are dangerous. On inhalation, throat passages and lungs swell, leading to hoarseness, hardening of the respiratory tract, and insufficient concentrations, suffocation and death. Contact with eyes can cause visual impairment. Ingestion can result in liver malfunction and coma. The flammability rating is one, indicating a material which will burn in air when exposed to temperatures of 1500 degrees Fahrenheit for five minutes or less. In other words, much like ordinary combustibles. The ignition temperature for anhydrous ammonia is about 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. According to NFPA, the flammable limits of ammonia vapor are from 16% to 25%. Because of the narrow flammable range, the product has been classified as a non-flammable gas. This attempt to ignite ammonia demonstrates that release outdoors is not usually a fire problem. There are seldom accumulations within the flammable range except in the proximity of large spills. There may be ignitable limits in discontinuous pockets but higher than normal ignition energy is required. Then if the vapors are ignited, the low flame propagation speed would preclude detonation. In a study of more than 500 outdoor anhydrous ammonia incidents by the National Transportation Safety Board, only three involved fire. Releases in confined spaces pose a more serious problem for emergency responders. The flammability issue was brought into sharp focus on a September afternoon in 1984. Units of the Shreveport Fire Department responded to a call for help by workmen attempting to repair an ammonia leak at a cold storage warehouse. Firefighters studied response guides and believed that they were dealing with a non-flammable gas in stabilized conditions. Members of the hazmat team donned SCBA and protective clothing and entered a cold storage room with a forklift to replace a leaking valve. Shortly, an explosion severely damaged the building. Combustible materials were ignited, and a severe fire ensued. One firefighter escaped through a hole the explosion had ripped in an exterior wall. Though burned over 70% of his body, he survived. Another firefighter died. And this is just one of a number of incidents in confined spaces on the record. While ammonia is very difficult to ignite outdoors, in the confined spaces in which refrigeration equipment is likely to be located, it is easier to get a mixture within the flammable range. Another consideration is the fact that anhydrous ammonia is a powerful solvent. Contamination of ammonia with lubricating oils in refrigeration equipment can result in what is termed a foul gas, which is more easily ignited. So when an ammonia release is discovered in a confined space, response personnel must approach with caution.
During any emergency response, a first necessity is to recognize if a hazardous material is involved in the incident and to identify the product. To make this determination, response personnel can use such visual information as container types, placards, labels, and other markings, and such observed reactions as vapor release. Information provided by witnesses or company personnel also may provide assistance. Anhydrous ammonia containers are distinctive and can be a clue to the product's presence. Ammonia in large quantities may be shipped by water, rail, or highway. Most tanks are painted white and are marked anhydrous ammonia. The product may also move by pipeline. In small quantities, anhydrous ammonia is shipped in steel cylinders. In storage, the product can be found in refrigerated tanks or pressure vessels. In agriculture, it may be found in nurse tanks or applicator tanks. All tanks must be specially manufactured for anhydrous ammonia service. Most containers are required to have pressure relief devices, but they are not required in cylinders of less than 165 pounds capacity. Certain ammonia tanks may be used interchangeably to ship LPG, so emergency responders must beware and verify tank contents. The Department of Transportation has classified anhydrous ammonia as a non-flammable gas for domestic shipments and as a poison gas for international shipments. Shipments must be appropriately placarded and as well carry the inhalation hazard label. Since the non-flammable gas placard is an incomplete description of the hazards, response personnel must look for the United Nations number 1005, which more specifically identifies the product. Despite the great quantities of ammonia in transportation, storage, and use, there are surprisingly few emergencies. An active program of accident prevention and safety inspections helps reduce the number of incidents. Outside or detached storage is preferred, separate from other chemicals. Inside storage areas must be well ventilated, non-combustible, and away from sources of ignition. Storage should be protected from vehicle traffic and heat. Cylinder valve caps should be in place when the cylinder is not in use and cylinders secured from falling over. Work practice should be designed to prevent the worker from coming in contact with the product. All equipment should meet standards for ammonia use. Safety showers or water tanks should be available since immediate application of water can help reduce the effects of contact with the product. Proper protective clothing should be provided including gloves, suits, boots, eye protection, and full face respirators with ammonia canisters for outdoor work on known concentrations and self-contained breathing apparatus for confined space work and emergency response. Facilities that store or handle anhydrous ammonia in quantities of 10,000 pounds or more are required to have a process safety management program which includes emergency response procedures. Vehicles transporting ammonia should have five gallons of water and appropriate face and eye protection as part of standard safety gear. Before loading or unloading, the tank should be inspected for damage. The vehicle should be level, brakes set, and wheels chucked. Transfer of the product, which is done by liquid pumps or compressors, should be carried out only by qualified personnel. An attendant should be present during the entire operation. Liquid should never completely fill the tank because the product expands when temperatures rise. Too much pressure in an overfilled tank can result in a discharge from the pressure relief valve or shell failure and release of the entire tank contents. Incidents involving small releases of the product occur more frequently. These can occur in refrigeration systems or during transfer operations. Pipes or valves may be damaged or fail. A tank may be overfilled. Releases can occur when refrigeration equipment or cylinders are damaged during a fire. When a discharge does occur, positive pressure SCBA for structural firefighting will provide the necessary respiratory protection. However, turnouts for structural firefighting do not provide complete protection against either the liquid or vapors of anhydrous ammonia. 
With Chemical Protective Gloves, SCBA, collars up and ankles and wrists taped, bunker gear can protect personnel engaged in evacuation and rescue work during outdoor unconfined releases, provided there is adequate water fog application for controlling vapors. But the neck and face are exposed and vapors may irritate the skin. Direct contact with liquid product may result in harm to the wearer. The first priority must be to isolate and control the area. The next task is to evaluate the affected area to determine whether potential victims should be evacuated or sheltered in place. In the case of an outdoor release, victims may be safe in relatively airtight buildings with heating, ventilating, and air conditioning shut down. Tape can be used to seal windows and doors. Wet towels over the face can help protect against low concentrations of vapor. Evacuees should be directed to safe areas, and response personnel must operate from a command post and staging areas upwind from the incident. Once risks to human life have been evaluated, response personnel may decide to take aggressive action to control the incident. The decision is based on having available sufficient trained personnel and adequate protective clothing, resources, and equipment. Entry into the hot zone requires chemical protective clothing. Vapor protective clothing must be selected, which is compatible with anhydrous ammonia. Such a protective clothing ensemble protects against vapors, but direct contact with liquid anhydrous ammonia may make the suits brittle and endanger the wearer to frostbite. Contact with liquid anhydrous ammonia should be avoided. Air purifying respirators are not useful for emergency response. These devices filter out only moderate concentrations of vapor. In an emergency, concentrations may be unknown or change rapidly. Positive pressure SCBA is the best respiratory protection. Remediation tactics will differ depending on whether the release is outside or inside. If the release is inside, anticipate ignition. While explosions are rare, in the case of refrigeration plants, one study has found an average of one fatality per explosion. A study of 140 fatalities at anhydrous ammonia incidents found no one was killed at a distance greater than 200 meters from the discharge. Because of the potential for explosion, the area should be isolated in all directions and even greater distances downwind. Only necessary response personnel should enter the hot zone, avoiding confined areas where anhydrous ammonia is discharging. If the supply of product can be shut down without entering the building, this is the first priority. Otherwise, it will be necessary to thoroughly ventilate the building. Only water fog or explosion-proof smoke ejectors should be employed. Positive pressure ventilation can be conducted without placing ejectors in the vapor. All nearby sources of ignition must be controlled. Following ventilation and before response personnel enter the building, Monitoring devices should be deployed to be sure the release is not within the flammable limits. Monitoring devices include detector tubes, toxic gas detectors, and ammonia detectors. Once inside, the source of the leak must be shut down before any repairs are made. This will require the assistance of personnel who are familiar with the system. Opening or closing the wrong valve can make a dangerous situation worse. CO2 has been used to mitigate vapor releases in refrigeration facilities.
The CO2 reacts with the ammonia and moisture in the air to form ammonium bicarbonate and ammonium carbonate. These are harmless materials which do not damage frozen food products the way water might. In the case of a discharge outside, the greatest danger is the vapor. Anhydrous ammonia vapors are lighter than air, but there is the potential for a negatively buoyant plume that lingers near the ground. Another consideration is that a lethal concentration of anhydrous ammonia in air is less than 1%. Such an air vapor mixture may be colorless and also linger near the ground. Theoretically, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, one volume of water will absorb about 1160 volumes of anhydrous ammonia vapor. Proper application of water fog spray is a proven and effective method of controlling outdoor releases. Pumpers should be positioned upwind and hose lines deployed downwind with nozzles arranged in a semicircle a safe distance from the point of release. The exact distance will depend on wind conditions and the size of the vapor plume. This establishes a water curtain. Nozzles are rotated to increase the water's absorption rate. Response personnel should not advance on the cloud, but rather let the cloud come to them. This knockdown water is caustic and can be harmful to water supplies and marine life, so runoff may have to be controlled. If water supplies are threatened, health, pollution control, and wildlife officials should be notified at once. Water should not be applied to pools of liquid ammonia or leaking tanks, since additional quantities of vapor will be generated. Another method of reducing vapor release from liquid spills is the use of foam. A thick blanket of foam is rolled rapidly over the entire spill. Some ammonia vapor may permeate the foam and escape into the atmosphere. Diking is a good way to contain spills. Soil and sand are the best materials to use for diking. In the event of a transportation accident in which there is no discharge, response personnel must take precautions. Tanks must be carefully inspected. Evidence of dents, gouges, and scrapes are cause for concern, especially if damage involves a weld seam. There have been instances of tanks failing sometime after the accident. Personnel should approach carefully, avoiding the ends of the tanks and emergency vents. Products should be offloaded before riding the tank. Always consult with container specialists and engineers before moving a damaged tank. In the event of a fire in which anhydrous ammonia is leaking, first priority should be to stop the flow of gas. It may be dangerous to extinguish the fire before stopping the flow as an explosive mixture may be formed which can do greater damage if reignition occurs. Cooling water is best applied in large quantities by unmanned monitors, since the danger of a violent rupture may exist. If anhydrous ammonia containers are exposed to flame, cooling water should be directed at the point of flame impingement. While this tactic is not recommended for containers not exposed to fire, cooling water will help reduce temperatures in the event of fire exposure. If possible, small cylinders and tanks should be moved away from the fire. Any victims found in the hot zone should be immediately removed to fresh air. Some symptoms of exposure are tearing, difficulty breathing, chest pains, and skin burns which rupture and bleed. The victim may be in great pain and near collapse. Lungs may fill with fluid, or the victim may be unconscious and turning blue from lack of oxygen. Contaminated clothing should be wet down and removed, and eyes and other affected areas of the body immediately flushed with water for at least 15 minutes. If breathing has stopped, artificial respiration should be applied. If there is difficulty breathing, administer oxygen. If the product has been ingested, have the victim drink large amounts of water. Vomiting should not be induced. The patient should be monitored and treated for shock as necessary and transported to an emergency medical facility as soon as possible. Personnel leaving the hot zone must have their protective clothing decontaminated even if only to allow the wearer to safely remove the clothing. Copious amounts of water will be the best decontaminant. Decon workers must be adequately protected. Hazardous wastes resulting from the emergency operation must be reported and removed to approved disposal areas. 
Sometimes contaminated runoff can be neutralized and disposed of in wastewater systems. This will create an environmental hazard if not done correctly. Before such action is taken, government, health, and wastewater treatment officials must approve. A product specialist or other knowledgeable persons must verify the contents of runoff. Once the incident has been brought under control, the site should be returned to use if possible. Anhydrous ammonia is a hazardous material which can cause burns and severely injure the respiratory system. In confined spaces, ammonia can mix with air to form an explosive atmosphere. When an emergency involving anhydrous ammonia occurs, response teams can lessen the effects of the incident by evacuating the area or sheltering potential victims in place, stopping the flow of product, and ventilating confined spaces. Water can be used to control vapors or to cool containers exposed to fire. To operate safely, personnel must use SCBA and proper protective clothing. Anhydrous ammonia is a product which is very beneficial to mankind. Although in wide use, accidents are few. But when an emergency does occur, informed, well-organized responders can protect lives and the environment and terminate the incident safely. dead and thousands more injured Bhopal India fact 23 dead and 130 seriously injured Pasadena Texas fact 8 dead and 128 injured Sterlington Louisiana fact chemical should never completely fill the tank because the product expands when temperatures rise too much pressure in an overfilled tank can result in a discharge from the pressure relief valve or shell failure and release of the entire tank contents. Incidents involving small releases of the product occur more frequently. These can occur in refrigeration systems or during transfer operations. Pipes or valves may be damaged or fail. A tank may be overfilled. Releases can occur when refrigeration equipment or cylinders are damaged during a fire. When a discharge does occur, Positive pressure SCBA for structural firefighting will provide the necessary respiratory protection. However, turnouts for structural firefighting do not provide complete protection against either the liquid or vapors of anhydrous ammonia. With chemical protective gloves, SCBA, collars up and ankles and wrists taped, bunker gear can protect personnel engaged in evacuation and rescue work during outdoor unconfined releases provided there is adequate water fog application for controlling vapors. But the neck and face are exposed and vapors may irritate the skin. Direct contact with liquid product may result in harm to the wearer. The first priority must be to isolate and control the area. The next task is to evaluate the affected area to determine whether potential victims should be evacuated or sheltered in place. In the case of an outdoor release, victims may be safe in relatively airtight buildings with heating, ventilating, and air conditioning shut down. Tape can be used to seal windows and doors. Wet towels over the face can help protect against low concentrations of vapor. 
Evacuees should be directed to safe areas, and response personnel must operate from a command post and staging areas upwind from the incident. Once risks to human life have been evaluated, response personnel may decide to take aggressive action to control the incident. The decision is based on having available sufficient trained personnel and adequate protective clothing, resources, and equipment. Entry into the hot zone requires chemical protective clothing. Vapor protective clothing must be selected, which is compatible with anhydrous ammonia. Such a protective clothing ensemble protects against vapors, but direct contact with liquid anhydrous ammonia may make the suits brittle and endanger the wearer to frostbite. Contact with liquid anhydrous ammonia should be avoided. Air purifying respirators are not useful for emergency response. These devices filter out only moderate concentrations of vapor. In an emergency, concentrations may be unknown or change rapidly. Positive pressure SCBA is the best respiratory protection. Remediation tactics will differ depending on whether the release is outside or inside. If the release is inside, anticipate ignition. While explosions are rare, in the case of refrigeration plants, one study has found an average of one fatality per explosion. A study of 140 fatalities at anhydrous ammonia incidents found no one was killed at a distance greater than 200 meters from the discharge. Because of the potential for explosion, the area should be isolated in all directions and even greater distances downwind. Only necessary response personnel should enter the hot zone, avoiding confined areas where anhydrous ammonia is discharging. If the supply of product can be shut down without entering the building, this is the first priority. Otherwise, it will be necessary to thoroughly ventilate the building. Only water fog or explosion-proof smoke ejectors should be employed. Positive pressure ventilation can be conducted without placing ejectors in the vapor. All nearby sources of ignition must be controlled. Following ventilation and before response personnel enter the building, Monitoring devices should be deployed to be sure the release is not within the flammable limits. Monitoring devices include detector tubes, toxic gas detectors, and ammonia detectors. Once inside, the source of the leak must be shut down before any repairs are made. This will require the assistance of personnel who are familiar with the system. Opening or closing the wrong valve can make a dangerous situation worse. CO2 has been used to mitigate vapor releases in refrigeration facilities. The CO2 reacts with the ammonia and moisture in the air to form ammonium bicarbonate and ammonium carbonate. These are harmless materials which do not damage frozen food products the way water might. In the case of a discharge outside, the greatest danger is the vapor. Anhydrous ammonia vapors are lighter than air, but there is the potential for a negatively buoyant plume that lingers near the ground. Another consideration is that a lethal concentration of anhydrous ammonia in air is less than 1%. Such an air vapor mixture may be colorless and also linger near the ground. Theoretically, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, one volume of water will absorb about 1160 volumes of anhydrous ammonia vapor. Proper application of water fog spray is a proven and effective method of controlling outdoor releases. Pumpers should be positioned upwind and hose lines deployed downwind 
with nozzles arranged in a semicircle a safe distance from the point of release. The exact distance will depend on wind conditions and the size of the vapor plume. This establishes a water curtain. Nozzles are rotated to increase the water's absorption rate. Response personnel should not advance on the cloud, but rather let the cloud come to them. This knockdown water is caustic and can be harmful to water supplies and marine life, so runoff may have to be controlled. If water supplies are threatened, health, pollution control, and wildlife officials should be notified at once. Water should not be applied to pools of liquid ammonia or leaking tanks, since additional quantities of vapor will be generated. Another method of reducing vapor release from liquid spills is the use of foam. A thick blanket of foam is rolled rapidly over the entire spill. Some ammonia vapor may permeate the foam and escape into the atmosphere. Diking is a good way to contain spills. Soil and sand are the best materials to use for diking. In the event of a transportation accident in which there is no discharge, response personnel must take precautions. Tanks must be carefully inspected. Evidence of dents, gouges, and scrapes are cause for concern, especially if damage involves a weld seam. There have been instances of tanks failing sometime after the accident. Personnel should approach carefully, avoiding the ends of the tanks and emergency vents. Products should be offloaded before riding the tank. Always consult with container specialists and engineers before moving a damaged tank. In the event of a fire in which anhydrous ammonia is leaking, first priority should be to stop the flow of gas. It may be dangerous to extinguish the fire before stopping the flow as an explosive mixture may be formed which can do greater damage if reignition occurs. Cooling water is best applied in large quantities by unmanned monitors, since the danger of a violent rupture may exist. If anhydrous ammonia containers are exposed to flame, cooling water should be directed at the point of flame impingement. While this tactic is not recommended for containers not exposed to fire, cooling water will help reduce temperatures in the event of fire exposure. If possible, small cylinders and tanks should be moved away from the fire. Any victims found in the hot zone should be immediately removed to fresh air. Some symptoms of exposure are tearing, difficulty breathing, chest pains, and skin burns which rupture and bleed. The victim may be in great pain and near collapse. Lungs may fill with fluid, or the victim may be unconscious and turning blue from lack of oxygen. Contaminated clothing should be wet down and removed, and eyes and other affected areas of the body immediately flushed with water for at least 15 minutes. If breathing has stopped, artificial respiration should be applied. If there is difficulty breathing, administer oxygen. If the product has been ingested, have the victim drink large amounts of water. Vomiting should not be induced. The patient should be monitored and treated for shock as necessary and transported to an emergency medical facility as soon as possible. Personnel leaving the hot zone must have their protective clothing decontaminated even if only to allow the wearer to safely remove the clothing. Copious amounts of water will be the best decontaminant. Decon workers must be adequately protected. Hazardous wastes resulting from the emergency operation must be reported and removed to approved disposal areas. Sometimes contaminated runoff can be neutralized and disposed of in wastewater systems. This will create an environmental hazard if not done correctly. Before such action is taken, government, health, and wastewater treatment officials must approve. A product specialist or other knowledgeable persons must verify the contents of runoff. Once the incident has been brought under control, the site should be returned to use if possible. Anhydrous ammonia is a hazardous material which can cause burns and severely injure the respiratory system. In confined spaces, ammonia can mix with air to form an explosive atmosphere. When an emergency involving anhydrous ammonia occurs, response teams 
can lessen the effects of the incident by evacuating the area or sheltering potential victims in place, stopping the flow of product, and ventilating confined spaces. Water can be used to control vapors or to cool containers exposed to fire. To operate safely, personnel must use SCBA and proper protective clothing. Anhydrous ammonia is a product which is very beneficial to mankind. Although in wide use, accidents are few. But when an emergency does occur, informed, well-organized responders can protect lives and the environment and terminate the incident safely. dead and thousands more injured Bhopal India fact 23 dead and 130 seriously injured Pasadena Texas fact 8 dead and 128 injured Sterlington Louisiana 